Ian Reisner, and I would have to say that I'm a serial entrepreneur. I had a real estate career, a career in retail, and now I'm an active real estate developer here in New York. My father was a stockbroker. My mom was in the uh, clothing manufacturing business, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to be in retail or if I wanted to be in banking. And when I graduated college, I took one interview with the Federated Training Program for department stores and one interview with Salomon Brothers. My father pushed me towards the stock side of the business, and I started at Salomon Brothers, and I had a 15-year career there. Along the way, I had an opportunity to start um, a retail watch chain with my partner, and I got to have a daytime job with an entrepreneurial job helping him grow out a watch company, a retail company. My partner, Matty, had worked for many years for the Swatch Corporation and told me that he wanted to start a watch shop that sold Swatch plus everything else. Swatch was a very big seller in the 80s and 90s in the U.S. And once I heard the idea of opening up a watch emporium where you would have Swatch plus everything else, which we named Watch World, I knew that was a great concept. So I spent all my excess time working on designing with my best friend from Cornell, who's an architect, and Maddie to design uh, a store that we ultimately called Watch World, which was basically a sunglass hut for watches. And once we opened that first store, it was clear to me that first Saturday that we were onto something unique and different. I can tell from the reaction of the consumers, they hadn't found a store where they could see sport and fashion watches displayed in such a neat museum-like experience, where we also offered service for bands and batteries. So we attracted many people from all over the neighborhood of the neighborhoods of the city to come to our store to get bands and batteries. And while they were there, they'd buy inexpensive sport and fashion watches. Um, and once I saw the success of that first store, I knew it made sense to do a second and a third. And once we did a second and a third, I knew it was time to write a business plan and grow the business. And we did. And I used my Wall Street connections um, to raise venture capital from a, a DLJ a retail venture capital group, as well as a traveler's uh, venture capital group. We raised about $15 million and grew 119 stores in seven years. And then finally, I used my Wall Street connections to market and sell the company, and we sold the company to Sunglass Hut International in 2000. One thing as an entrepreneur, you're always looking um, to ways to cut costs, and um, very often you hire family members. And a couple times I had family members involved in the company, and that often would be a big cause of stress and, and, and debate and, and fights. So um, I'd be very careful to mix um, business and family. That's one, one, one lesson that I learned from being an entrepreneur. Never underestimate your competition and their ability to be more creative and copy what you do. Um, right after we opened the first store, Sunglass Hut started to copy us and produced a copycat chain called Watch Station. They literally took pictures of our stores. They hired away our workers. They wrote down our exact product mix, and they copied us. So never, and they actually opened 45 stores while we only had three. We went from one to three, and they went from one to 45 in the same time frame. Fortunately, we understood the watch business better than them, and we understand the, the nuances of service and the right selection, and we managed to, um, to beat them in, in, in terms of sales per store throughout the country. But I think one lesson is never underestimate the ability of your competition to copy you and beware of that and be prepared to fight. In 2005 and 2006, when we were planning a building, many of my friends and family and colleagues in the industry said that it's crazy. There are so many condos being constructed in New York and the market was going to be, there would be a glut in the market and we'd suffer just like other places like Las Vegas and like Palm Springs and San Diego and for that matter Miami. And what I've always told people is you really have to always go back to the demographics. And New York has a unique, unique situation. Every single family in every part of the world wants to send their firstborn, their brightest child, to get ahead in the world. And one of the first places they think of is New York, maybe London. So we have the brightest minds. We have almost every major corporation with some type of headquarters here. We have every industry here. And as a result, the demographic inflow of people is consistent, and it means we have a growing population. We had uh, 8 million people just a couple years ago. We're about 8.5 million people now, and growing. So there's needs and consistent needs for more houses and more apartments and more hotels and more restaurants. So the demographics of New York are positive, and it's a growing city, and as a result, I'm still bullish on residential real estate. That doesn't mean prices are going to go up 5, 10, or 15% a year, or more like they did a couple of years ago, 
but it means that prices will remain firm and probably trend up over in time with inflation. So I think that New York City, so New York City re real estate is a stable, growing market in my view. When we were looking to develop residential real estate, I was trying to think of where would be the best place to develop. And many brokers showed us extremely inexpensive land in places like Newport, New Jersey, and Newark, New Jersey, and Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and Williamsburg, and Long Island City, and even the World Financial District downtown. And what I said to Maddie is what we need to do is we need to find a needle, a needle in a haystack. We need to go back to what my father always taught me in real estate, which is location, location, location. And when we found this piece of land on the far west side in Hell's Kitchen, I knew that was it. Why? I watched as I grew up. My uncle was gay, and I saw what was going on in the West Village. In the 80s and 90s, I saw what was going on in Chelsea, where I came out, and where I went to my first gay bar, and I had lots of friends living. I had lots of friends living. And starting around the year 2000, I saw a migration of bars and restaurants, and for that matter, friends, moving to Hell's Kitchen. And I knew that would be the next Chelsea. I really did believe that. And when I bought the piece of land on West 47th Street, west of 10th Avenue, everybody thought I was in the outer, outer zones of the city. And I thought it was crazy. We were a five-minute walk to Times Square. And we're in the heart of Hell's Kitchen. And now 10th Avenue is becoming a little bit like 9th Avenue. Um, a Bartini Bar opened a few weeks ago on 45th and 10th. There's a great restaurant called 44th and 10th on 44th and 10th. And here we are on 47th and 10th with a robust neighborhood the gentrification is in full swing. And to solidify that gentrification, Kimpton Hotels from San Francisco just opened a hotel on 48th and 11th called Inc. 48, and Ogilvy and Mather moved their worldwide headquarters from, World, from Worldwide Plaza to 47th and 11th in July with 2,000 young professionals working there. So I had a belief in Hell's Kitchen. I saw the gentrification happening. I thought it would continue, and it's actually happened much quicker than I expected. I joined Salman Brothers in 1990. Um, this is the time when John Goodfriend was still there. This is the time that the book Liar's Poker came out. I worked on a fixed income trading floor. The word Big Swinging Dick was established at that point. I worked in the most machismo, masculine, straight, difficult environment. So bad there were many times I wanted to quit because of the discriminatory behavior, the comments, the notes left on my desk. Fortunately, at one point, I came out to my boss, and it turns out he was extremely, extremely homo-friendly. And he was quite shocked that I was experiencing such a difficult time on the trading floor at Solomon Brothers. And what he did is he had a meeting with the entire trading floor one day when I went home and told people that in his environment, on this trading floor, there was going to be no discrimination. There was going to be no making anybody uncomfortable. And Solomon was a very diverse culture. There were many minorities of every type working on the trading floor. There were many women, and for that matter, there were some gay people as well. And I was the first person that I, that I know of that actually came out on the Solomon trading floor. And I was known as a gay guy, a gay professional. I was also a top salesman. And I think people respected that I was so successful. And um, coming out ended up being, being a good experience for me at Solomon. And I was comfortable being out and forward about it. And I think my clients, and my clients for that matter, many of them knew I were gay. And it, it worked fine, and I would even get invitations to parties, both corporate as well as personal parties, where my significant other was invited, my partner was invited to uh, corporate, corporate outings. And um, I was proud to be a leader in the gay community at being out and successful. After I came out to my boss, and I think he, in some not so indirect, after I came out to my boss, and in a very direct fashion, he made it clear to everybody on the Solomon trading floor that making somebody that's gay uncomfortable would be totally unacceptable, it became, it, it, it became much easier to work there. I think people, generally speaking, are not homophobes. They, they just go with the stereotypes. But once they realize that one is among them, um, it all falls in place. I think the same thing in the Army. Everybody thinks that you know, gays in the military are going to cause uh, unit, uh, the opposite of cohesion. Um, they're going to disrupt unit, unit behavior, but it turns out most people don't have an issue with it, but everybody thinks somebody else has an issue with it. So um, people don't have an issue, generally speaking, with gay, and we're in a very liberal city, New York, anyhow. Any troubles starting a copy being a gay entrepreneur? Um, in the real estate development business, um, being gay has been a bit of a challenge. Most of the people in the construction industry are pretty... Um, pretty straight, pretty tough, 
and I think that they might view um, gay men developing real uh, gay men as a client as easier. And um, we've had to be very firm working with our construction crews and um, um, to make it clear that we're as tough and as nimble as any straight or gay businessman. My favorite gay icon and why? Um, just shows I don't think about people gay or straight. I just think about people that are talented. Um, my favorite gay icon. Okay, good. Um, my favorite gay icon by sh by my favorite gay icon would be the head of the city council in New York, Christine Quinn, number two to the mayor. Talented, smart, open, out, vocal. That is a great icon. She's a real leader in the community, in the gay community, and she's a real spiritual leader in the city, and she's a real leader of the city. So Christine Quinn would be my favorite gay icon.